My name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I started leading physical tours, what seems to be a long time ago doing physical tours, um, with EF tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my travel program and can't wait to get back in the air and on the ground to physical travel. Now I also lead adult only tours with EF Go Ahead Tours, as well as several other organizations. I also offer family friendly tours and as a certified travel agent, I can also book you on your dream, dream trip as part of a group or on your own. Just reach out to me if you've started to think about physical travel again, and I can work with you to make sure that you uh, get exactly what you're looking for. In terms of the virtual tour series, there's a couple reasons why I started this series nearly a year ago. I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restrictions where they haven't been able to work at all. And I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my group and also for the people that we've met through friends, family, social media, and other means. We've done about 38 or so tours in the last year since COVID has struck. If you'd like to access any of the recordings, they are available on my website, girltraveltours.com. There is a virtual tour drop-down menu that you can see all of the tours that we have already done. You can also access them on Facebook and on my YouTube channel. We've had several more tours planned in the coming months, and I'm gonna review them with you just in a moment. So we have on our website ready for signups, a musical tour of Britain, Antarctica, Andalusia, Mexico, Jerusalem, Belgium, Portugal. We also have uh, the Danube River Cruise. It's a mystery on the Danube, um, it's south of France. And we are locking in some future tours for the summer months, including ancient Rome, Sydney, Australia, Wales and Cornwall, India, and Venice, to name a few. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them. My travel um, tour directors and tour guides have jumped in to, to partner with me on this, and we have been able to share with you many different regions all over the globe. I know many of you have found my virtual events through Facebook, and some of you are on Facebook right now viewing the live stream. I just wanted to once again warn everybody about the um, scammers that are on Facebook that are trying to direct you to um, fake pages to give credit cards. Please know, don't ever give a credit card to enter a free virtual event. My virtual tours, the presentations that we do, are they do not require a credit card to join and you can always safely access our events through my website, girltraveltours.com, or by viewing them on my Facebook page. Just don't click on any of, the, um, any of the links in the comments directing you outside. And if you do, if you get to something that's asking you for a credit card to enter, please just, just walk away, just get out of that as soon as you can. Okay, so before we get going, I wanted to share with you a few ways that you can interact with us. Feel free to ask questions to the tour director and to me in the Q&A, and also use the chat feature if you want to communicate with me directly during this event. You can also use the, um, the feed in Facebook. I go back and forth and look at both of those, so we try to answer questions from both. Um, I always like to do an interactive poll before we get going, so I'm going to launch that at this point. And of course, my polls always say, kind of the same things, which is, what is your connection to the Vatican City? I've been and loved it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location, or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. I know given the fact that we just got through Easter and celebrating Easter Sunday, um, this was an appropriate tour to take right after that celebration. So I'm hoping that a lot of you um, are answering in that way. So let's see, it looks like we have about 45% that have been and loved it. And we have a slew of people 
who um, have have no set plans that are interested and are here for, and are here just for the virtual experience. So that's about thirty eight percent. So, but it does seem that most people forty three percent have been and loved it. I'm in that category myself. I've been several times and I completely enjoy it and actually had the pleasure of um, seeing it with our tour director today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna move on now. So as you know, all of our tours here are scheduled for 90 minutes plus the Q&A. So hopefully you are ready with a snack or a drink in hand and you're ready to get going. A tour wouldn't be complete without a fantastic tour director. For those unfamiliar with group travel, a tour director is like a personal concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans and makes sure your experience is full of education, stressless and easy to navigate. These are by far the most important people in your group. And if we're not traveling, these tour directors have not been working. So I will share with you in the chat and the Q&A how you can tip the tour director if you're so inclined. All of the tips go directly to the tour director once collected, minus the Zoom operating expenses. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only keep our desire to travel alive until it is possible for us to travel once again, but also allow a tour director to do what she does best and share her knowledge and passion for travel. Today, we're lucky to have back my dear friend and a virtual tour series fan favorite. She's super knowledgeable about her country and the EU and is an art historian to boot. She's very excited to share her passion for the Vatican with all of us today. So I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Elena Salerno. Elena, if you're ready, you can join me and I will turn over this event to you and you can get into your presentation. Hello everyone. Hi, thank you Mara for your introduction as usual. Hi everyone, welcome on my behalf as well to this event. Uh, Mara, as soon as you're ready, I'm ready to share my screen. Should I go? Let's go. All right. So let me share my screen so I can show you the slides that I've prepared for tonight. And here we go. Okay, so Vatican City State. Um, as usual, a uh, very small disclaimer. This is not at all a comprehensive tour of uh, all that there is to see in Vatican City State when you visit. It is a very small state, but it's very, very rich in content and in uh, different environments that you get to see when you, when you experience Vatican City State in person. So uh, let's say that this is a highlight tour of what uh, you can expect to see, a little uh, savoring uh, of the experience that would be a way fuller one uh, if you go in person. So let's start because uh, as usual, we have a lot to cover. Uh, a very short outline to show you uh, what we're gonna do together tonight. We're gonna start with the very basic information regarding the state that we visit. And then we delve into the actual virtual tour, going through the collections of Vatican museums, uh, visiting Raphael rooms. We're gonna enter together the Sistine Chapel at the end of the pathway through the museums. And we're gonna end up inside St. Peter's Basilica and also visiting the square in front of it. Now to cap this off, uh, an imaginary day together spent at the Vatican, I included a little aperitivo at the very end. Uh, as always, I like to give you a reference, a geographical reference point uh, um, to give you an idea of where you are compared to the place that we visit virtually together, and I use latitude to do so. With Vatican City State, we are on the 41st parallel north, which is the yellow line marked on the map, and Vatican City State is there where you see the dot in the south of Italy. Now, from Vatican City State, uh, um, if we move uh, uh, eastward, we would encounter along the same parallel the city of Istanbul in modern Turkey, and um, crossing the whole of Asia, the parallel also passes through the bigger of the Japanese islands, uh, Honshu. Whereas from Vatican City State moving westward, we would encounter still in Europe uh, on the west coast of Spain, the city of Barcelona. 
in the US, uh, Chicago, and finally, the parallel runs uh, through Eureka on the West Coast. So these are your geographical references. So here it is, uh, Vatican City State. Uh, uh, this is actually uh, a reconstruction of the state, a model of the state made out of Legos. I find it uh, kind of amusing. Uh, but it, it kind of already shows us uh, how small the place is. Uh, it is the smallest state on earth, the smallest nation, less than one square mile, the area that it covers, albeit it's the richer, uh, it's the richest, sorry, state on earth. Uh, but even if uh, uh, it is the smallest, uh, it is a state uh, in every aspect. Uh, so for instance, uh, they issue, they have a postal service, they issue stamps, uh, they issue passports, so they are very, very very rare and they don't last a lifetime, only the time of your service within the Vatican borders. They issue car plates, of course, SCV, the state of the city of Vatican, because it's uh, the Italian abbreviation. And they also have their own coinage. Uh, so they do use the euro currency as we do in the European Union, even though Vatican City State is not part of the European Union. Uh, but we're on the bills. Um, they use the same uh, images, the same print that we have in Italy. The coins uh, are minted in the Italian mint, so they use our mint, uh, but they, uh, they choose, they customize their coins with their own uh, images with their own symbols. They also have uh, uh, a lot of channels of communication. Uh, Radio Vatican has been active uh, since the 1930s. They also have what they call nowadays Vatican media, which includes uh, their television channels, but also all their social media accounts. And they print uh, a daily newspaper, daily in the Italian version. Uh, it is also printed all over the world uh, in uh, many different translations and many different languages, even though in some countries uh, it's issued once every two weeks or once every month and not daily as it is uh, in Vatican City State as, and in Italy. Uh, this that you see in the picture now is their flag, so you have it divided into two fields, a yellow one and a white one, and on the white one you see the coat of arms uh, of uh, Vatican City State, uh, which is made up of the two crossed keys, uh, symbolizing St. Peter, the Apostle, the first Pope, and uh, the uh, headdress that in Latin, it still bears the Latin name of Triregnum, it's a triple crown, you see one on top of the other, that the Pope wears. Uh, they don't wear, wear it anymore, not even for their uh, incoronation, but it is the traditional headdress uh, of popes throughout history. Now, this is a historical image uh, to uh, talk about when Vatican City State was born. This is the moment when a pact, a treaty was signed. The guy signing the paper, the register on the right in the image is Mussolini, our then prime minister. And to his right and our left, the other person seated is Cardinal Gasparri, the cardinal that was the emissary of the Pope for the um, completion of this treaty and the signing of it, the treaty is called Lateran Pacts. It was signed in 1929 and it determined the birth of Vatican City State in the borders that we see today. This international treaty regulates the relationships between Italy and Vatican City and it is still to this day the one that regulates these relationships. So it is still valid today. We've, ne we've never changed it. Uh, of course, the head of Vatican City State is the Pope, uh, nowadays Pope Francis, the first of his name, the first Pope ever in history to choose uh, the name Francis when he was elected. Um, and the Pope is a very unique figure in the world, uh, being having two uh, sides uh, to his um, power, let's call it. He is the head of the church that he presides, so the Catholic Roman Church in this uh, instance. So he is the spiritual guide uh, and the highest rank uh, of the clergy of this church, but he also have, have a political power uh, in the sense that he is the head of an actual state. Uh, in the case of Vatican City State, uh, we're talking about an absolute monarchy. It is one of the very few left uh, on earth. Uh, 
we all know about uh, uh, Pope Francis being the Pope nowadays, uh, but we live in a very strange time that started when this uh, event happened. Uh, this is a picture taken on the night of the 12th of February 2013, so very recently, only seven or eight years ago. And on that night, uh, two lightnings struck uh, the top of the Basilica of St. Peter in, in Vatican City. Uh, this happened, the two lightnings striking the Basilica happened only hours after Pope Benedict XVI renounced to the papacy and decided to step down. So, uh, of course, many people linked uh, the atmospheric event uh, to this decision, uh, but we live in a very unique and strange time where we have actually two living popes. Um, this almost never happens because, of course, the papacy is a title that you carry all the way to the end of your life, usually. So now that we've seen the general aspect of the aspects of this uh, minute state, let's uh, see more clearly where it is placed. We are here on the Italian peninsula. Uh, we will zoom in aiming at that yellow dot that you see. So we start seeing the city of Rome, which in the borders more or less are these circular highways around it. And then zooming further in, we get closer to Vatican City State. This is it. I marked the borders in yellow so that you can uh, see them. Of course, Vatican City State is a landlocked state and it is within uh, the city of Rome. So totally encompassed uh, by Italian territory. When we look at it from different perspectives, uh, we notice, first of all, the gardens, the beautiful gardens uh, that you can visit with a guided tour. They make up for half the territory of Vatican City State. The buildings in the foregrounds in the foreground now are occupied by the collections of Vatican museums. And the huge monumental building that you see in the middle of it all is St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, we end uh, with a frame uh, that shows us the front, the facade of the church, uh, with a huge uh, square of St. Peter right in front of it that we'll visit together at the end. Uh, in this image, I highlighted uh, the buildings. Uh, of all the buildings uh, that are present uh, on Vatican territory, I highlighted in red the ones that are dedicated uh, to housing the collections uh, of Vatican museums. Uh, and you can already tell that a big chunk of Vatican buildings is occupied by the museums. Uh, the collections um, comprise 40,000 works of art. They are not all on display because they lack, of course, the room to have them all on display at the same time, but they do have on display half of them. So 20,000 pieces, art pieces, uh, is what you can see if you spend several weeks, I would say it would take uh, inside uh, the Vatican museums. Now, I highlighted the corner on the bottom right in red, and let's uh, get into reality. This is it, uh, that is, uh, this is that corner. And uh, this image allows me to show you two things. First of all, Let's, uh, uh, let's be thankful of uh, the possibility of having a virtual tour. Otherwise, uh, we might be lining up with all these people who are waiting to get to the ticket office and the entrance of the Vatican Museums. Uh, uh, Vatican museums are one of the biggest museums in the world and also one of the most visited together with the Louvre. They always are in competition for first place. Uh, they are visited annually by between six and eight million people, which makes uh, for several uh, thousand people a day, many of whom uh, don't book ahead. <laughs> so my first suggestion, if you do plan to visit in the future, is definitely book your tickets ahead. So you won't have to line up in the scorching sun uh, in the streets of Rome in July. The second thing that we see in the picture is this massive defensive wall. Uh, the whole of the state of Vatican City is surrounded uh, and comprised within this massive ring of defensive walls, uh, all but the square of St. Peter that's left open in a communication with uh, uh, Italy that is right outside it. The walls uh, surrounding Vatican City States uh, were uh, city state were built between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance times uh, in order to make, even though Rome was uh, 
completely owned and ruled by the Pope at the time, but the citadel within these walls uh, was fortified uh, so as to have a place uh, um, that could be defended uh, and where the Pope could retreat uh, in case of an attack, of course. The corner of the walls of the Vatican walls that we're looking at right now in this specific corner was designed by Michelangelo. Michelangelo is one of the great artists that we're going to talk about together uh, that worked uh, several years uh, in the Vatican for several popes. Uh, and he didn't just produce artworks. Uh, he also was an architect and he was used uh, by uh, a pope uh, at some point uh, to design uh, these defensive structures. Um, so let's... Uh, uh, grab our ticket and let's start our visit. We start tonight on this virtual tour exactly in the spot where I usually start when I'm there in person with my clients, this lovely cozy terrace that opens up uh, to the right. We can see it in the picture, but on a portion of those Vatican gardens that I was mentioning before, so that you can glimpse into them. They are not part of the usual classical guided tour of the Vatican museums. Uh, they are a separate type of guided tour because really it would be too much even for uh, one whole day. But the terrace also allows us uh, to have this fantastic view overlooking the dome that is the one crown the Basilica of St. Peter that we are going to visit at the end of our tour together. It is important uh, or it is uh, worthy to look at it from this terrace uh, because at some point while they were building the Basilica and it took 120 years to build it, but at some point while they were building it, they changed the, des the design a bit. They made it longer than it was supposed to be in the original design. Uh, so the result is that the Basilica is bigger, but also if you're standing right in front of it outside of the facade uh, nowadays, you cannot see the dome anymore because of of course, the facade was made uh, to come forward into the square. So this is a view from the side where we can take, uh, had we been there, the perfect picture of this dome that is very, very unique in its design. In Rome, there are thousands of churches and many of them are crowned or topped with domes, but this is always very, very recognizable. It is one of the symbols of the city of Rome, even though it stands on Vatican soil. Uh, it is the tallest uh, still today building in Rome. Uh, there's no written rule, but it is something that everybody respected the idea of never building anything that went higher than the Dome of St. Peter out of respect. And the dome was designed uh, by none other than Michelangelo. So he was, uh, as I said before, also an architect and the design of most of the church uh, was uh, was done by him before he died. He didn't see the church completed, but they respected his design once he passed away and another architect took over. So now from the terrace, uh, we actually dive into our tour. Uh, we first stop into this lovely courtyard before actually entering the palaces of the Vatican Museums. This is the octagonal courtyard or simply the octagon in the Vatican because of the shape it has. It has eight sides. And this courtyard, uh, other than being a lovely relaxing place, uh, even though in the picture we see it empty, but usually it's very, very crowded. Um, this courtyard was, um, it's a very symbolic place for the Vatican Museums. It was uh, wanted by a Pope, of course, and this is a Pope that we're going to name a lot during our tour tonight because he has um, made a lot of decisions regarding Vatican Museums and the collections and the art that we'll, that we'll see. His name is Julius II, and he reigned as a Pope uh, during High Renaissance time. So we're talking about the beginning of the 1500s. So he called upon a very famous Florentine architect that was already working for him in Rome in other projects, and he asked for an octagonal courtyard to recreate a place where you could be your create your creativity could be inspired and tingled. So the architect created the octagon, placed the fountain that you see with some greenery in the middle, so that also the murmuring of the water and the splashing of the water could convey again creativity. The vegetation. Uh, at the origin were laurels, uh, olive trees, and orange trees. 
And then these niches on the sides were beautiful antique statues that could be put on display. Pope Julius II was a big lover of the arts and he, during his lifetime, was a, a huge patron of the arts. And he had a private collection, his own private collection of ancient Roman and Greek statues. Uh, we are going to look at one, the one that we have right across the courtyard in this photo, this one. This statue is named after the main character, Leocon, and uh, it is a very ancient uh, Roman statue made out of marble uh, that was found at the beginning of the 1500s underground in Rome. Rome is the gift that never stops giving um, because of the level of the ground rising during the centuries. We keep, if we dig, finding artifacts and architectures coming from ancient times. So one day this statue was discovered underground underneath a vineyard, a privately owned vineyard. And it made uh, the news. It was a big, uh, um, a big find that even at the time they recognized, of course, that this was had a value. So the news traveled throughout Rome. The Pope heard about it, and being a, 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 an art buff as he was. Um, he was very interested in seeing this sculpture. Now, at the time, he already had Michelangelo working there for him in the Vatican. And, and Julius II did this a lot. He, he went to Michelangelo and said, look, Michelangelo, since you're here, could you please also do this other thing for me? And so when he heard about this find, he asked that Michelangelo go and see it, evaluate it. Michelangelo was already recognized as being a genius at the time. So he had the eye to actually evaluate this statue and then come back and report. So Michelangelo goes, sees the statue, he recognizes it for what it is, a fantastic original ancient Roman sculpture, goes back to the Pope and says, Julius, absolutely get it. And Julius II buys the statue and he decides to place it exactly where we see it nowadays. It's been there for 500 years. Now this gesture by the Pope uh, of placing the statue in this courtyard, it might not seem much to us nowadays uh, because we're used to statues in our public squares or in the places where we uh, are current, where we are commonly uh, walking through every day. But it was a revolutionary gesture. It is the first time in history that a monarch uh, or a person of power, instead of buying a piece of art and just putting it inside his own bedroom or his own living room, puts it in a place where everybody visiting the palace can also see it and enjoy it. So at this time, we are in 1506, the Vatican museums don't exist yet. The palaces are the private residence of the Pope and his court, but the, the, the octagonal courtyard could be seen by everybody living with the Pope, his court, all the cardinals, every artist living there and working for the Pope, every visitor, diplomats, other heads of state on in visit to the Pope, they could all enjoy this piece. So even though the Vatican museums were opened two centuries later, this event, art historians all agree that this gesture is uh, the spark that then produced uh, the opening, the idea of opening a place to the public where everybody could enjoy the art of the popes. Now we enter the palaces uh, of, oh, sorry, this is another image. I wanted to show you the statue also with a black background because with this uh, striking white marble, you can really appreciate the different details. Uh, we enter, as I was saying, the actual buildings of the Vatican Museums, and we find ourselves in this uh, hall, and we look uh, at another piece of ancient uh, sculpture that is right in the middle, is displayed in the middle of this uh, hall. Uh, going closer, this is the piece. It is called the Torso of Belvedere. Now, Belvedere is the name of this palace. So lots of pieces of art uh, uh, displayed in this palace take on this name. And Torso, because as you can see, it lacks many parts. It's very heavily damaged. Uh, it 
it's missing its head, its arms completely, and half uh, of its legs. So why does such a damaged piece of sculptural work, uh, is, why is it displayed so prominently in the room, in the very center of the room? Let me show it to you again with a, back, with a black backdrop and on both sides. Even though the sculpture is so damaged, you need to be able to walk around it and see it from all sides in order to actually enjoy it. So let's do it together. When you are looking at it while walking around it, you can really appreciate the details of the anatomy in this body. Every single muscle is chiseled to perfection. Uh, it is very accurate uh, in showing us an, the anatomy of a human body, but not just the muscles, but even the torsion and how the muscles react to this movement of the body. So this is an ancient uh, sculpture from the first century, and it tells us that the ancient Greeks and Romans were able to do this. They had this skill. So this statue is important, not just because it's a beautiful ancient piece, and already this gives it, it gives it a lot of value, but also because we know that from the time when it was discovered during the Renaissance to this day, it has inspired and it has been studied by so many artists that have sketched it and studied it for so long, because especially in the Renaissance, you know that Renaissance means the rebirth, no, Renaissance, rebirth of what? Rebirth of this interest in nature, in how things work, in how they actually are, and in having the skill to represent them exactly. So the Renaissance artists like Michelangelo, like Leonardo, they went back to the ancient artists to look at their works, to learn again how to do this. This skill of being able to represent nature, a human body or a nature in a painting exactly as it is very close to reality is something that was lost during the Middle Ages not because they weren't capable of doing it, but because that's not what it, they were interested in. In the Renaissance, uh, they get interested again in this thing. And so artists study these pieces. This is why it's so important that the popes had their own collection that these artists could study. Other than Michelangelo and Leonardo, we have lots of sketches. And so I wanna give you just three examples uh, to show you how through history, uh, this kept happening. The first to the right is Rubens in 1601. The second is the Spanish painter Goya in 1771. And the third one sketched in 1892, is by a very young 11 year old, if you believe it, Pablo Picasso. So the fascination of this piece keeps going all the way to nowadays. This is a, a contemporary ad campaign, of course, a photographic campaign done for Emporio Armani. Uh, the model, David Beckham, gets asked to pose in the same pose as the Belvedere torso. And if you notice, even the t-shirt or the, the robe that he has on is draped in a way that hides his arms so that he even more adheres to the image of the Belvedere torso. So we are fascinated by this piece uh, still to this day, and even Armani or uh, his uh, photographer uh, chooses to pay a homage uh, to this piece. So we leave now the collection of ancient statues uh, and we start walking through miles of corridors. Uh, this is one of the galleries that we pass through to get to the Sistine Chapel. This is um, probably the most uh, scenographic one, definitely objectively the longest one, the gallery of the geographical maps. Uh, the names in the Vatican are very straightforward. Uh, this is a gallery on, on uh, the walls. Uh, you have uh, geographical maps painted uh, of all the regions uh, making up the Italian peninsula. So the name uh, comes from the art that is on display. The ceiling is also 
a work of stucco and fresco fantastic at the end of this gallery we get to a point uh, where we start talking about an artist uh, that i wanted to introduce uh, with uh, what is written on his tomb this is what they say about this artist they say nature feared to be outdone by him while he was living and to die with him upon his demise this is how good he was and we're talking about Raphael. Now, Raphael worked for the same Pope Julius II that we were mentioning before that had the courtyard designed for his statues. Julius II was occupying, as every other Pope before and after him, a set of rooms as his own private rooms within the palaces of the Vatican. And he called upon Raphael, who was already considered uh, a genius in his art uh, to decorate his rooms. So we're talking about four rooms, uh, one after the other. These were the bedroom of the Pope, the library of the Pope, the study of the Pope. So imagine these four rooms were where the Pope spent most of his time and worked. And these four rooms get painted on the walls uh, by Raphael. Now, it's very difficult uh, to, to let you understand, if you've never been, what these rooms look like with just a static picture. So let's use uh, some virtual aids, uh, some technology, and go around. This is the first of the four rooms. And when you visit in person, this is the first one that you enter. It is called the Room of Constantine because on the four walls, uh, four episodes of the life of Roman Emperor Constantine are depicted by Raphael. Now you might ask yourselves, uh, what is uh, a Roman Emperor doing on the walls uh, of the Pope? And you'd be right. Uh, the thing is that Constantine, Emperor Constantine the uh, first, who lived uh, and was uh, ruling in the in the third uh, in the fourth, sorry, century after Christ, so three hundred years after Christ, uh, bears a lot of importance not only for the church but for the history of at least the Western world. And the answer to why does he have this importance lies here. This is a packet of palm oil cigarettes. And this is definitely not me trying to incentivize you to consume tobacco products. I just wanted to show you what's on this packet to show you how the importance of what Constantine did 300 years after Christ seeps through history all the way to nowadays. And we still remember this on a packet of cigarette, which is a very trivial object. So what you have to look for is right in the middle, that writing that I enlarged here, it is a Latin phrase that reads in oxigno vinces. And we can translate it in English with under this sign, thou shall conquer. This refers to something that happened to Emperor Constantine and that Raphael depicts. This is one of the episodes chosen by Raphael for the room of the Pope. This is a detail of the fresco. And the episode happened on the eve of a very important battle that Emperor Constantine was going to fight on the next day. And he said that uh, he had a vision in the sky where this, uh, where this symbol appeared, which is the cross that you can see here in the sky, together with some words. Uh, now in the fresco, Raphael chose the Greek version and tutoinika, but it is exactly that uh, inoxinio vinces that we were seeing before on the Paul Malls. Uh, so he believes, Constantine chooses to believe the vision and orders his soldiers, his troops, to each paint a cross onto their wooden shield and to ride into battle bearing this sign, this symbol on their shields. Now the battle goes very well for Constantine. He uh, wins it and he attributes the win to the fact that he was fighting under this sign, this symbol. So he starts believing that the true God is the Christian God. Let's not forget 300 years after Christ until this moment, the Romans were not Christians, they were pagans. They were worshiping a multitude of divinities and Christianity was considered still a sect uh, that had to be persecuted. So many Christians uh, became martyrs at this time because killed uh, by the Roman authorities who tried to erase Christianity from the face of the earth. 
Constantine is the emperor who starts believing. He, this is the moment after fighting this battle when he converts himself to Christianity. And he also more importantly emanates a law that allows for a freedom of creed. You could profess any religion of your choice. You could be a pagan, but you could also be a Christian suddenly. It wasn't something that you had to hide anymore. So Christians can stop uh, digging tunnels underground and building the catacombs underground to worship their God, to get married, to bury their dead, and they can start building churches above the ground. If this is not a revolution or a turning point in the history of Christianity, yes, but definitely also something that changed history forever. So if you ever visit Rome, or if you have visited, you might remember if you go to the Colosseum that you see here to the right, you cannot miss this huge uh, triumphal arch that is right next to it. This is the Arch of Constantine put up in his honor to honor to remember that very same battle that we talked about. So he is very much remembered uh, in Rome, uh, not just in the Vatican. Now, the next room in the series of Raphael rooms, we're going to look at this one, is the Stanza della Segnatura, the room of the Segnatura. Segnatura was a, a sort of ecclesiastical tribunal that at some point in history had its seat in this room. When Raphael paints it for Pope Julius II, the room is actually the Pope's library, private library, so where he studies, where he reads, where he relaxes. And we're gonna look at again, four sides all painted, all with one scene. We're gonna look at one of the scenes, the one that you see on the right uh, in this image. So frontally, this is it. It is titled The School of Athens. And it shows us uh, the, a group uh, of uh, the most important and famous thinkers and philosophers uh, of antiquity all gathered up uh, in this imaginary classical looking architecture. The two in the middle framed uh, by the archway are the most important philosophers, at least uh, uh, according to the Renaissance times. Uh, so let's look at them closer. They are also on your ticket when you enter the Vatican. They are the symbol of Vatican museums. The one to the left, portrait of Leonardo as a homage, is Plato pointing upwards because he was in his life interested in studying the beyond. The one to the right is Aristotle with his hand outstretched in front of him pointing to the ground because he believed uh, that the truth lies in this world, in the things of this world. So you need to focus your interest on nature and on the human being instead of what's up in the clouds uh, as Plato thought. Now in this composition, there is one figure that I wanna show you specifically, this lone one in the foreground. He wasn't supposed to be there. He is a later addition. We have uh, also the drawings uh, that Raphael did uh, when he was preparing the scene, so before he painted it on the wall. And in the drawings, uh, this figure is not there. That's an empty space. What happens? Uh, during the same days uh, when Raphael was working in the, the rooms of the Pope, uh, two doors away was Michelangelo painting for the same Pope uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now, Michelangelo was uh, always very secretive about his works and he never wanted to unveil it uh, before he was done. So probably the Sistine Chapel was seen only by the Pope uh, before uh, Michelangelo was finished. But my, uh, Raphael, Raphael was dying to look at what his biggest rival was doing on the ceiling of the chapel. So legend goes that one night uh, uh, Raphael snuck into the, the chapel, the Sistine Chapel, and looked up and his jaw dropped. And, and he couldn't but admit to himself, first of all, probably, that Michelangelo was uh, the genius that everybody was talking about. So as a homage, uh, even though they were rivals to his biggest competitor, he decided to place a portrait of Michelangelo. That's who the character in the foreground uh, is um, in the rooms of Julius II. So now we find ourselves at a threshold, uh, this heavily guarded wooden door. When you open it, this is where you find yourself. So we enter the Sistine Chapel. Let's look at it together.
so jaw-dropping, isn't it? Like it was for Raphael. So to talk about the Sistine Chapel, we need to talk about another Pope, Sistus IV, who came before Julius II. Uh, Sistus was Pope at the end of the 1400s, so at the very beginning of the Renaissance times uh, uh, regarding art uh, from the perspective of art history. Uh, Sistus IV is the guy seated on the papal throne that you see to the right in this beautiful fresco. And uh, uh, he was also the uncle of Julius II. And uh, he was another patron of the arts, uh, art lover, who spent a lot of energy and wealth uh, to enrich the city of Rome and the Vatican. So he's the one who wanted uh, a, a chapel for the palace where he was living, for the Vatican palace, so a palatine chapel to be built. And this is it. This is the Sistine Chapel from outside. And I know it looks very off-putting from the outside. It looks very defensive. Uh, it was indeed designed and built by a military architect. But then, of course, inside it is wall to wall, the most beautiful art that could have ever been gathered in one uh, single room. Now, Sistus IV uh, wants the chapel built, and of course, he also wants it decorated. Uh, he, oh, sorry, chapel in numbers, just to give you an idea, built 1475 to 81. A little bit of a curiosity, 1475 is also the year when Michelangelo was born. Uh, their destinies were tied, the, the chapel one and Michelangelo's one from the beginning. The um, dimensions of the chapel, it's not very big. It's like two tennis courts uh, put together. Or in another statistic that I loved very much when I read about it, you could fit 6,000 Sistine chapels inside New York City's uh, um, Central Park, to give you an idea of how small it is. But it is very tall, 68 feet uh, from the floor to the top of the vaulted ceiling. So you could fit a seven story or eight story building within the walls of the Sistine Chapel. Now, as I was saying, Sistus IV, the Pope, wanted the chapel also decorated because you're the Pope, you don't want whitewashed walls. And this was the original decoration of the chapel. This is, I know, a horrible image, but there's no pictures, of course, of what the chapel looked like in 1475. We only have possible renderings. I wanted to show you that the ceiling, this is one of those renderings, the ceiling was not decorated with any figures. It was just painted blue and dotted with golden stars. And this was very typical, a typical way of decorating a church ceiling in these times. There are plenty in Italy that still resemble this, uh, this style, one for all. Maybe you will remember if you have attended the event uh, that we did in January uh, regarding Florence and Tuscany, I showed you this uh, cathedral, the one in San Gimignano. Uh, the cathedral in San Gimignano was never altered, so it retains the aspect. You see the, the blue with the golden stars on the ceiling that it had uh, originally, and that was also the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Sisters the fourth. Uh, uh, focused his attention for the decoration of the chapel on the walls, on the longer walls. And he uh, hired a dream team, really, of Florentine artists, the best of his time. We are, remember, one generation before the big names. Uh, Leonardo is already a little bit older, but Michelangelo has just been born and Raphael is even younger. So one generation before, the best artists coming from Florence uh, are all hired by Sistus IV uh, to work in his chapel. And uh, the stories that the Pope wants on his walls are on one side, the stories of Moses, so stories coming from the Old Testament, and opposite, in a dialogue almost with the first scenes, stories from the life of Jesus, so the New Testament, another very typical theme for a sacred space. These are six examples of these panels that are one next to the other on the two longer walls. And maybe you can tell that even though the artists uh, were many, the style uh, is very much uh, fluid and unified. And this is because there was one chief artist controlling the work of uh, uh, all the others. And he ended up uh, later on being the master of Raphael. So Perugino was his name. Another one um, working in the chapel was Botticelli that I'm sure you've heard of. The first painting to the left is his. And yet another very famous one who ended up being Michelangelo's master, Ghirlandaio. So how did did Perugino uh, obtain uh, this uh, unification of style with all these uh, 
incredible famous artists are all wanting you know to leave their own mark well first of all he uh he placed the rule that everybody had to have the same line of the horizon so there's no two paintings one next to the other that have two different lines the one on one upper and one lower it's all the same so this already gives a certain unity and then if we go back to the paintings also you see that the palette of colors that they used is very similar in every work and especially the dimensions of all the characters on the different planes uh, is exactly the same in every picture. So everybody had uh, left their mark, their style, but following uh, similar rules uh, uh, to, uh, you know, keep it uh, all unified. Then we get to Julius II, the nephew of Sistus IV. We see him here portrayed by Raphael, who was one of his favorite artists. But it is the relationship, the encounter between Julius II and Michelangelo, these two great people, these two great men, these two geniuses that sparked some of the best art that the world has ever seen. So Julius II asks of Michelangelo that he decorates with a story that ceiling, remember that until this point, until the 1500s was left blue with golden stars. And Michelangelo, albeit uh, not happily, leaves us uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. 12,000 square feet of plaster that he had to cover with his figures. He uh, paints uh, several hundred figures uh, and uh, uh, he uh, creates a very intricate uh, composition. Let's break it down so that we can understand better what he did. The central strip of this vaulted ceiling is dedicated to telling us the stories of the book of Genesis. Uh, as if in a comic book, Michelangelo, one scene after the other, tells us the story of Genesis. He divides it uh, in total in nine scenes, nine moments, three triplets, uh, three groups of three. You know that three is the most perfect number for Christians, three times three. Couldn't go more perfect than that. So let's see them. The first triplet. Uh, and then you have the second and the third. So the first scene, God separating light and darkness. And look at the movement that Michelangelo put in this painting. It looks like he's moving in the air, floating, creating, you know, in the, in the moment of creation, he's taken by what he's doing. And then in the second scene, God is again hurtling through the air, moving quickly from one point to the next, leaving in his wake the planets, the sun, the moon, on the left lower corner vegetation. He's creating the world. And in the third scene, the, the, the last one of this first group of three, maybe he's separating the waters from the land, but maybe he's also hovering over what he's done looking down at what he has created and assessing that it is good. Now, the next three scenes are the central one in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And of course, uh, after the creation of the world, uh, we get to the creation of mankind. Uh, this is the creation of Adam. It is one of the most famous scenes in art history. I think all of us have seen it uh, also declined in many, many ways. We see it on t-shirts. We see it uh, placed on mugs. Uh, there are commercials uh, still th today that uses use the poses of the different characters to remind us of that because they know that us, the audience, uh, looking at this uh, will probably recognize uh, the hint. Uh, now, this was just for fun. Uh, I found this image. This is in the studio of a plastic surgeon. So he decided to place uh, the figure of Michelangelo's God uh, uh, from the creation of Adam next to his lift and the writing underneath it says be born again because he's a plastic surgeon so the creation of adam i found it very very smart and clever uh this is also very um recent it happened last year this is in ukraine the ministry of culture was um finding that people were not sticking too much to the rules uh, regarding uh, you know the containment of the pandemic uh, 
And so they asked uh, uh, an, an advertisement agency to, to, to create a campaign uh, to promote uh, these uh, behaviors. Um, and the agency chose very famous works of art, uh, changing them uh, to convey the message. And in this case, you see, they cut out Adam, they cut out God, and still we know what this is uh, taken from, the creation of Adam of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. Lastly, this is definitely definitely a homage uh, by Steven Spielberg to the grandness uh, of uh, Michelangelo. So let's go back to it. Again, we've seen it many times, but probably if you've never really dwelled uh, uh, in front of it and looked at it for a long time, or if you've never studied it, uh, you, you might not have noticed uh, that the two fingers uh, they don't really touch. Michelangelo left uh, just a few millimeters between those two fingers. Uh, and if you look at Adam, uh, he is created, definitely. He is a body made of matter. But look at how languidly he's lying on the ground. Look at how heavy that arm is on the knee and the hand just there. And compare it to God. Uh, who is so active looking and, and dynamic in, in, in this uh, floating in the air. It looks almost as if it's in movement. So we understand that Michelangelo puts a cliffhanger in there for us. And he has us on the edge of our seat because we understand that we are looking at the moment before those two fingers are going to touch. And when that touch is going to happen, that's when a spark will pass through from God to Adam, instilling a soul in this body and actually making it alive. Now, if we look at the side where God is, you see he's surrounded by a group of angels, but there is one figure that is uh, very much close to him. He's embracing this figure. Who is this figure? This is Eve a beautiful Eve. Now this of course is Michelangelo's interpretation of Genesis. You don't find this in the scripture, but in Michelangelo's mind, Eve was always there from the beginning. She's never been an afterthought. She was already there in God's mind, in his plan together with Adam. And it was just a question of creating one first and the next, and then the next. And look at how intimate she is with him that she curls her hand around his forearm while he embraces her her. Now, one last detail. This is a very recent proposition by art historians. Some agree, some still don't. So I will leave it up to you to decide if you agree with this interpretation. If you look at the group of angels and surrounding God and this red drape, especially surrounding them, someone in this shape see the section of a human brain. Now, we know for sure that Michelangelo dissected cadavers. He worked on human bodies, not because he was morbidly attracted to death. Uh, he was not the only one doing it, even though it was heavily forbidden by the church, but Leonardo too, and many more artists uh, who, because of what I told you before, they were interested in how the body works, uh, the inner works of this machine to be able to understand it and then, and hence represent it well. So maybe uh, he uh, wanted to recreate this shape to symbolize God's mind, his brain, and the project for the universe that he's creating. We never know. Uh, now, the third uh, and last of these three central scenes is the creation of Eve. She's coming out of a sleeping Adam, going towards God. And uh, one is the detail that I want to point your attention to. This one, and not the creation of Adam, this one uh, is actually the central point. It marks the dead center of the chapel. This is one of many details that Michelangelo placed within the chapel decoration to uh, hint at his uh, high, at, at, at what high regard he kept women. And this is very typical of Michelangelo's way of thinking. So that's why the creation of Eve is the central scene. The next one that closes up this central triplet is on one side to the left, the two of them now created with these beautiful, striking, strong young bodies enjoying heaven. But that's the tree and they're already picking the fruit and the serpent, uh, look at this beautiful uh, sunset colored serpent is crawling around the tree, tempting them. And in fact, uh, 
The tree acts as a caesura. It brings us to the next side of the scene. On the right, we see them after they've committed the original sin and look at what happened to them. They now look old and tired. And, and horrified by what they did and, and scared, and they, they fold onto themselves in the shame of their nudity. Now, the last three scenes uh, uh, depict the stories uh, from the life of Noah. I'm gonna just show you one. This is the one where you see the ark and the big deluge. Uh, what happens is, this is the end of the story of Genesis, but these three scenes uh, of the life of Noah were the first ones that Michelangelo painted. And of course, you understand that to get up there to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, 68 feet above the ground, he had to build a scaffolding. So he worked up top of scaffolding. It was a big, huge scaffolding. He couldn't just uh, take it apart every night and put it back up every day. He kept it there until he was done with that piece of, of ceiling. And then he took it apart and moved it to the next section. So once he was done with these three scenes of Noah, that's the first time when by taking apart the scaffolding, he was able to look at what he had done from the floor and not from high up and close up on the scaffolding. And he looked up and he realized he had made a terrible mistake. He had treated these three scenes as if it, they were paintings. But if you think about it, when you look at a painting, you're very close to the painting, you're right in front of it, and you can see the details and you can look at it well. But these scenes would be seen by everybody in history from 68 feet below. And so he had to change and you saw how he did it. He made his characters fewer, fewer figures in each scene, way bigger, more starkingly contrasted with the background so that you can really tell who is who and what is happening in each and every one of the scenes. Now, surrounding these nine central Genesis scenes, a whole architecture of characters. These are prophets and sibyls. They are prophets in Christian times, sibyls in pagan, more ancient times, but they are all people who foretold the coming of the Savior, so they are worthy of a spot in the Sistine Chapel. On the four spandrels on the corners of the ceiling, we see the heroes and the heroines making a safe the way. This is David killing Goliath, and then we have Judith killing Holofernes. And then in the smaller triangular sections, we have Christ's ancestors, groups of a mother, a father, and their children or child, to show us uh, where Christ came from. Uh, this is uh, uh, a letter. This is actually a, 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 some poetry, a sonnet, uh, wrote by Michelangelo. This is uh, uh, an autographic uh, paper that's kept in Florence. Uh, Michelangelo wrote a lot. He wrote a lot of letters to his friends, so we know his firsthand thoughts a lot because we have these letters. And he was also a poet, maybe you didn't know. He was also good at writing poetry, so he wrote a lot of sonnets. In this specific sonnet, he describes and complains a lot about all the obstacles that he has to overcome while painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And he talks about how uncomfortable this job is. And in this little sketch on the side of the sonnet, he depicts himself in the position that he had to keep all the time to paint the ceiling. So standing up with the neck crane back and his arm outstretched to arrive at the ceiling level. In the sonnet, he says, uh, I'm aching all over. My, the back of my head touches, uh, touches my loins uh, to, to symbolize the fact that he had to bend. Uh, I am strung like a bow and the brush uh, paints a carpet of color on my face because of the colors dripping uh, on his face while he was uh, painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So he did complain a lot, but Michelangelo was also a stubborn old man and he decided he would need, he would want no help in painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So remember 12,000 square feet of ceiling. He did it all by himself in four years, three and a half years, he was done. 1508, 1512, are the dates of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now, we have one more chapter in the history of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, when Michelangelo paints the ceiling, he is uh, in his early 30s. 
30 years go by. So we have another Pope, uh, not Julius II anymore. This other Pope wants one more scene added to the chapel. He calls again Michelangelo to do this. Michelangelo is now in his 60s. So for the times, he is considered an old guy, even though he's going to go on to live until he's 6, 89. But he was already considered an old guy. But the, being the genius that he was, everybody wanted Michelangelo. Now, this is the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. Now, in any church, the altar wall is the most important one of all. When you see it at mass or at a wedding, you are looking at the altar where mass is being said, and you are looking at whatever's painted behind the altar on the wall. So this is a wall that the focus of everyone, you know, is, is onto this wall. So it's important to have something uh, sending a precise message. The Pope wants the last judgment uh, painted on this wall, and Michelangelo does it. Now, Michelangelo, again, does it alone. He paints... Uh, this composition made out purely of bodies. There's no architecture in this. And 391 different figures, no two alike. This is what he paints. The way he um, decides to paint the Last Judgment is kind of revolutionary for the time. And he paints, uh, let's look at details, uh, uh, bottom left corner. These are the souls that are saved. Uh, you know, the last judgment is the end of time. There's no more time. And Jesus is judging the soul of anybody who's ever lived. If you've been okay, you will go up in heaven to join him for the rest of eternity. If you haven't behaved, you're going to go down to suffer for eternity in the bowels of hell. So on the left side of the painting, we see the souls of the ones that are saved, uh, getting their uh, earthly bodies back from the graves and uh, uh, a surging to heaven. So flying up to heaven, the ones who've made it already, they turn back to help the ones coming. And in an incredible vignette of unity, Michelangelo shows us a black man and a white Men together being pulled up in, in, in an incredible symbolic image of solidarity. In the top left corners, the, the, the heroes of the court in paradise, these are the martyrs and the saints who had given their life. So they are the ones who mostly deserve to be to be up in heaven, Michelangelo decides to show them to us as if they were athletes. They were these uh, incredibly powerful chiseled bodies, not because he was gay, as many people try to use as an explanation for his muscular bodies, but because yes, he was fascinated by the human body, but also because he's choosing to show inner fortitude and character to depict it as external strength. So he's showing us actually the souls of these people who believed so firmly that they were ready to give up their lives for their beliefs. In the center of the scene, presiding this vortex is God, Jesus, with his hand raised. He's judging everyone with the position of his hands. It looks like he puts this vortex in motion next to him, the Virgin Mary. But if you look at Jesus, look at his body, look at the way he's depicted. This is another novelty that Michelangelo introduces. He looks like a Greek statue. If you remember back to the, if you think back at the Laocoon or the torso of the Belvedere, this is him. So Michelangelo takes inspiration from ancient Roman and Greek art to give us the body of Jesus and even his face. A beardless Jesus, whenever have you seen a beardless Jesus, he usually wears a beard and he's got also these golden hair. He's Apollo. He's the, go the god Apollo taken from statues of the private collection of the Pope. So this is where the importance of being able to enjoy this art, this ancient arts uh, uh, comes into uh, works from other eras. 
the bottom right corner is dedicated to the souls of the damned people who uh, have not behaved in life. They are dragged by all these different types of demons. Uh, it's very, it's very uh, amusing to look at all the different demons when you're there. Dragged down all the way to the bowels of hell where you see uh, the ever-burning fires of hell. Now in this painting, in this composition, as I said, 391 figures, uh, there are only three portraits. Uh, I'm gonna show you two. When this painting was finished and unveiled, especially thanks to the printing press, we are in the 1530s, the printing press is already a thing, so images can circulate easily at this point in time. And because of this, a lot of people see this, and it is not long before this is deemed pornography. People are complaining very vocally about how is it possible that the Pope allows nudity in his own chapel. So this is sacrilege and it has to be changed by Michelangelo. He has to cover up the nudity of all these characters. And uh, Michelangelo depicts himself uh, in a self-portrait uh, in this character. Now, this is St. Bartholomew. Uh, the character is St. Bartholomew. St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Mm? So he's always represented holding his own skin. Uh, but if you look at St. Bartholomew, other than this very chiseled body, he's an, an old man, bald, with a long gray beard. If you look at the face on his, what is supposed to be his own skin, the guy's not old anymore. He's got jack black hair, curly hair, no beard at all. So who's the face on the skin? It is Michelangelo's own face. So he places himself in the painting, depicting himself as a, a, an empty skin because it is said, uh, because of uh, this is the way he felt uh, with all this heavy criticism that his painting was receiving. And one last detail, a very funny one in my opinion, I don't know if you see the highlighted portion is the very last lower right corner. This character is another portrait. Uh, this guy, was very vocal in criticizing Michelangelo, but he was a very important person at the time, he was a very famous person. He was a, a cardinal, first of all. So he was part of the papal court and he was the master of ceremonies for the Pope. Um, Biagio is his name. So we remember him. Um, Biagio was the most vocal one, the most vicious critic of Michelangelo's work. And he goes to the Pope relentlessly asking the Pope to censor this painting. And Michelangelo decides to put his portrait in the painting, of course, uh, in hell as one of the demons. Now, the face is a perfect portrait of Biagio, so everybody entering the chapel at the time would recognize that this was him. Uh, but Michelangelo portrays him with these long donkey ears uh, that at the time everybody recognized as a symbol of extreme stupidity. And then there's this big fat snake crawling around his body and biting at his genitals. Uh, so you definitely didn't want to piss off Michelangelo, he had a, a terrible character. Now imagine this guy, Biagio, that had been vocal about general nudity. Imagine when he sees himself depicted like this. He storms to the Pope. Um, the Pope was Paul III at the time. He storms to the Pope and says, Paul, I mean, are, are you kidding me? You cannot allow this. I'm a cardinal. So I'm a, I'm a holy person of the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm your master of ceremony. I, I'm an important person. Everybody knows me. Everybody will recognize me. You can't allow this. This is absolutely unacceptable. You have to go to Michelangelo and ask him to change the features of this character in the painting. And the Pope famously and wittily replied, Biagio, my friend, I totally feel for you. I, I would totally react as you are uh, had I been in your predicament. The only thing is, uh, I am the Pope, as you well know, and I have no, uh, no uh, saying whatsoever of, uh, over what happens in hell. And, and you, my friend, are, are definitely in hell. So I'm sorry, can't do anything about it. And Biagio there stayed for all eternity for us to mock him even 500 years later. So here you have it. This is the whole of the Sistine Chapel decoration. We've got the beginnings of everything on the ceiling. We've got the stories unfolding in history on the sides. And we've got the endings, uh, the, the ending of everything uh, on the back uh, uh, altar wall. The alpha and the omega and everything in between is comprised within this compressed space. I urge you also, 
in this picture, you can do so relatively, but especially when you go to look at the floor. The floor is a fantastic bicolor black and white mosaic of marbles. It is incredibly precious. It looks like a, a marble carpet. It is very difficult, uh, granted, when you're there, you're usually surrounded by 20,000 people. So to see what you're walking on to is difficult. But if you have the chance, if you go, my advice is also take in the, how beautiful the, uh, the, the floor is. Now, one last detail about uh, the paintings of the Sistine Chapel. They underwent uh, uh, a huge uh, cleaning uh, very recently, recently meaning uh, 40 years ago. Last year marked the 40th year from the starting of these uh, restoration works. Uh, um, they lasted quite a while, 19 years, uh, to clean all the walls and the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But look at the results. The one to the right, of course, is the before, and the one to the left is after the cure. Uh, the thing is, we are very lucky to live in a time when we can enjoy Michelangelo's paintings and the other paintings in the Sistine Chapel as they looked uh, when they were just made, uh, with the brilliance on the, of the colors uh, and all the hues uh, and the shadows and the light that they originally had. Because for century, for centuries, uh, the fumes of the candles burning, the fact that the windows of the Sistine Chapel were only recently sealed and for so long let in the pollution coming from the city, and all this dirt and grime stuck to the painting surface. Look at how it dulled out everything and it it really made the paintings, uh, this is a detail of one of the scenes of the, of the ceiling, uh, but even better, this is the whole ceiling uh, on the right before the cleaning, on the left after the cleaning. So this was something, it was called the restoration of the century. This is also the reason why you cannot take pictures when you're inside the Sistine Chapel because the copyright on the images were bought by a Japanese TV network who paid um, the most, for the most part, uh, these uh, restorations uh, to be able to be the ones uh, filming the restoration in progress and then also taking their own photos. Um, now, this is a little thing that I wanted to add um, for myself more than anything. This is Maestro Colalucci. He was the chief restorer of the Sistine Chapel. So his name will forever be linked to the one of the chapel. And he passed away only the, a week ago. And so it was a very sad moment for me. Uh, if you are interested in art, uh, he wrote a beautiful book about his experience cleaning Michelangelo's uh, frescoes uh, entitled Michelangelo and I. So you might wanna look this up. And so this was my little homage to Maestro Colalucci. Now, the Sistine Chapel is a live thing. It's not dead. Uh, we visit it every day. It is a part of the museums uh, in the Vatican, but it is also a sacred space. Uh, this is why there are very strict rules when visiting. Uh, sometimes during the year, Mass will be held in the Sistine Chapel for very special occasions, but uh, uh, particularly it is the site, uh, it is the, the place uh, where the conclave happens. What's the conclave? The conclave is the election of the new Pope. Now, conclave, it's two Latin words. It means literally with key. So locked in, the cardinals get locked into the Sistine Chapel until they decide. This tradition it has a very long history, uh, but to make it short, uh, uh, it is to avoid uh, the cardinals electing the new Pope by being influenced from the outside. So no contact with the outside whatsoever, no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter, no phone calls, no internet, no TV news, no nothing. They cannot have any contact until they're done deciding and electing a new Pope. Uh, this is what the square of St. Peter looks like during a, a, a papal election. Now, you might ask yourselves, if the cardinals are locked in and cannot communicate with the world, what are all these people doing there? Can't they just wait, uh, you know, for the news on TV and then see the Pope afterwards? No, because uh, that roof uh, that you kind of glimpse from the square is the Sistine Chapel. And within the chapel during an election, this uh, 
uh, wood burning stove gets placed in a corner of the Sistine Chapel with a very intricate system of piping that conveys the fumes uh, into the temporary chimney placed uh, on the roof and visible from the square. So what, uh, what gets burned uh, in, this, uh, in this stove? everything that gets written down during a papal election, every note that the cardinals take, even their private notes, every ballot that they cast, every scrutiny, every vote, everything, at the end of each day, if the election lasts more than one day, gets burned in the stove. And some liquids get added to the stove in order to color the smoke coming out of the chimney. If the smoke is black, the people in the square know they have to come back tomorrow. We still have no Pope. The election hasn't finished yet. If the smoke is white, as is in this uh, example that I'm showing you, a cheer goes up from the crowd because, of course, it is a huge event for Catholics. So we, we finally uh, have a Pope. We're not without Pope anymore. And then the Pope, of course, uh, presents himself uh, from the balcony of uh, St. Peter's Basilica and blesses the square for the first time. This is the square of St. Peter and the Basilica from up above. Uh, and you see how the Basilica is... Um, rests uh, at one end of this long avenue. Now, the avenue is Italy. Mm? And only where you see the square beginning, that marks the border between the Italian state and Vatican City state. We see it here as if we were approaching the Basilica, and you can still see the dome. Remember, if you get too close, you can't see the dome anymore. Uh, and uh, from the dome, you see, you look into the square, and you see this the long avenue that we were seeing from an aerial view before. When you're standing in the square, Oh, sorry, the columnades, uh, sorry, uh, encircling the space, the oval space, uh, uh, were built up uh, uh, as a message. So instead of having a circular square or a square square that is uh, finished within itself, uh, they opened up the shape into an, an open oval, an open ellipse, with these two round columnades symbolizing the arms of the church. So when you're coming from Italy, from the avenue in front of us and entering the square, Christianity is unfolding you in a welcoming embrace. So it was meant to be an inclusive uh, uh, des a design conveying inclusiveness. Uh, the columnade is beautiful to walk through. It's a forest of column and it's only the only thing providing shade on those scorching July days. So if you are visiting in the summer, you really want to get into the columns uh, and underneath the columnade. From the square, you can also see the the buildings, the complex of buildings that are named apostolic palaces. This is where the popes live, even though Francis doesn't. Uh, he's an exception. He took a vow of poverty before becoming pope and he decided to respect it even after his election. So he decided to choose a more humble residence within uh, the Vatican. But this is where his office is uh, and where his court uh, works and lives. Uh, so the window of his office is this one. This is the window from which he shows himself uh, twice a week. Uh, if you visit St. Peter's Basilica on Wednesday mornings or Sunday mornings, uh, you can actually listen to the Pope uh, uh, sending a message and blessing uh, uh, the square. From the square, you can also see a couple of Swiss guards. Uh, they are very folkloristic, uh, only military corps that the Vatican still retains. Uh, they are nowadays uh, the personal bodyguards of uh, the popes, and they are also one of the more long-lasting uh, um, army corps in service continuously in history because they uh, they have been in service for more than 500 years now. It was that same Pope Julius II that we talked about before who decided he wanted Swiss uh, uh, soldiers uh, fighting for him, Swiss mercenaries at the time fighting for him, and they are still guarding the entrances uh, to the Vatican City State. State. So this is the square with the beautiful facade of St. Peter's Basilica, the columns on the side, and this needle in the middle that is an Egyptian obelisk. This is actually 
actually the most ancient uh, uh, object in the square 4,000 years old. Let's look at uh, how the square came to be and why the Basilica of St. Peter. So we have the modern square with the obelisk marking the middle, but suddenly the square uh, fades uh, and we go back in time to the year 64 after Christ. The obelisk at this time marked the center of a stadium, the stadium of Emperor Caligula. And just outside the stadium uh, is a cemetery, a necropolis. Uh, um, you, you see, it looks like a city, but it, all these little houses are actually mausoleums uh, of uh, um, rich uh, ex-slaves uh, families that bury their family members here. And even uh, the Apostle Peter was buried here with a simple tomb marked by a red plaster wall. After two centuries of pilgrims coming to visit the tomb of the apostle, a little temple, it's added uh, to mark the spot uh, and show you exactly where he is. But some time goes by and Emperor Constantine, remember, makes uh, the Christian religion legal and he decides uh, to build on top of that tomb a church, uh, one of the first ones ever, the, the Basilica of Constantine. Sometimes goes by still, and Pope Julius II decides to renew the aspect of this church by building a new one on top of it. This is the basilica that we have today. And in correspondence with the tomb of St. Peter, the Pope's altar, the canopy, framing it, thrusting upwards 96 feet tall and crowned by the dome that we saw at the very beginning of our tour, designed by Michelangelo. This is the, do is the dome, sorry, as you see it uh, when standing at the altar of St. Peter in the very middle of the church. Uh, by the way, you can ascend the dome. It's 500 and some steps. So you really, um, you earn several meals if you go, and then you are also rewarded with this fantastic view. If you remember, I told you it's the tallest building still nowadays in Rome. Uh, this is the canopy, the gilded bronze canopy grand uh, that was built to frame the main altar, the altar that only the Pope can use uh, uh, when he says mass uh, inside uh, the church of St. Peter. This is it from the front. And if we were to draw a straight line from the top of the dome down through the canopy and underground, we would reach the tomb of the Apostle Peter, the Prince of all Apostles and the first Pope. So this is why the Church of St. Peter is built here and why it is so important. The nave of the church, this is what you see when you first enter through the door. This is the biggest church on earth. It is super wide, really long, really tall. The height at the dome, so definitely the tallest point of the church, is 450 feet. So you could fit a 45-story building or skyscraper underneath the dome. And uh, of course, very richly decorated. Uh, if you, in this point, turned right, uh, this is what you would see. This is Michelangelo's Pietà. So we look at it from a little bit up closer. Um, a Pietà in art is a scene showing us a Madonna, a Virgin Mary, holding in her arms on her lap uh, the body of her dead son. This you won't find in, in the scripture. Uh, th there's, there's no such thing in the Bible. So this was invented by artists. Uh, and it was called pietà, which means compassion. So to, to provoke uh, compassion in you. Uh, the scene is set, of course, after the crucifixion and before the resurrection. So the body of Christ has been taken down from the cross and his mom is cradling him in her arms and crying her dead son. Now, Michelangelo uh, sculpted this uh, incredible piece of art from one single block of marble. The both figures are attached. They were never detached. They come from one single block of marble that he hacks at and then chisels at until he shapes the two figures. And he again is revolutionary. This comes first. This uh, sculpture was done by Michelangelo way before the Sistine Chapel ceiling and before the Last Judgment. 
When Michelangelo sculpts this, he is 23 years old. He's just arrived in Rome from Florence and look at what he does. But especially we can appreciate his genius by looking at what Pietas looked like until this moment. This was how Pietas looked like. They were very crude, very harsh depictions of the body of, of the, of the um, wounded body of Christ with the rigor mortis shown. These were the only Pietas there were at the time available. And when Michelangelo saw these and he was asked to sculpt a Pieta, he looked at these and he said, nope, I don't do ugly. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this. And he invents a new way with a super beautiful young Virgin Mary that he was criticized for. They say, how can she be younger than her 33 year old son? And Michelangelo scoffed at them and, and he cited Dante, his divine comedy when Dante says she's the daughter of her own son. So of course she looks, uh, she looks uh, young and beautiful. She has a spark of divinity in her and Christ uh, with this beautiful body once again taken from from Greek and Roman statues resting on the knees of his mom. This is in one of the side chapels in St. Peter's behind a very thick bulletproof glass to prevent from vandalic acts. Now we exit the church. This is the grand monumental facade of St. Peter's as seen by the center of the square. It is starting uh, to get uh, um, darker. So we want to give a last uh, look at the square, uh, all around the square. You know, I like uh, places like this after dark. If you've seen the, <laughs> my other presentations by now, you know. So I'm fascinated by these places all lit up at night. And as I promised at the very beginning, we're going to cap off our imaginary ideal day together with an imperative. And I chose a very special secret place uh, that is right off the square where to have this imperative, this, uh, this terrace uh, uh, that overlooks uh, the Basilica of St. Peter so that this would be uh, what we, we could look at uh, while sipping our spritz. This is one of my suggestions for your next Italian trip, especially if you visit in the summer, you want to try one of these, just try it. It is not a spritzer. I know you know the spritzer, this is something else. And it's very difficult for me to uh, make you understand what it tastes like because the orange color, it's given by an, a, a liquor that it's made and sold only in Italy. So very different. Let me tell you, it's very fresh, uh, uh, served with a lot of ice. Uh, it's bubbly. It is not sweet though. If you like sweet, uh, no, this is bitter. And it's supposed to be enjoyed with uh, olives, peanuts, chips. So before a meal, you have your aperitif with very salty stuff. And this spritz is fantastic. Now I'm ending with the same image uh, that I used as a cover for the presentation, because this is my last suggestion. If you ever visit Rome, this is something that you can do yourselves. Uh, uh, you get to this spot on one of the hills uh, of the city of Rome, uh, and there is a garden that you cannot visit. It's private. So this picture was not taken from within the garden. You are outside the gate, uh, and the gate is locked, but there is a keyhole. And let me tell you, the garden is property of the island of Malta. The, the garden and the villa are property of the Knights of Malta still today. So if you peek through the keyhole, the nice thing is that you are standing on Italian ground, peering through Maltese territory and looking into Vatican City State. So three countries on one spot. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Wow. Mara, right back to you. <laughs> I am here. That was amazing. And I've actually been to the Vatican with you and I learned more today <laughs> as well. But, but I will say, Elena, the thing that I thought was um, just, the, just something that stuck with me and I'm now never going to um, think of Michelangelo in any other way other than I don't do ugly. So I, I love that. <laughs> well, it's a nice way not to yeah. cast Michelangelo. That is, that is exactly the explanation we all need. Um, so thank you very much. I, I know the, um, 
the comments are, are streaming in that they, they're they just so impressed with this tour. You know, so many people have been there before, studied it in art history, learned about it from other people, but your perspective was so different and so much more inclusive and the anecdotes you shared were lovely. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. We, we thank totally you, thank appreciate you. it. My so pleasure. I'm gonna give you a second to um, take a sip of your drink before we get into the Q and A. Um, everybody out there, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to go into the Q&A in a moment. Um, just so you know, uh, I obviously do um, physical tours and on the slide up right now, I'm giving a list of the physical tours that we have planned in the future, in the near future. If there's any interest um, with anybody, these are group tours um, so, and all are welcome. So, you know, drop me a line um, via email. Um, my email is marawalsh at gmail.com and I think it's on the slide, but uh, just reach out if you have any questions or if you need more information on anything. Um, and again, I did include the ways in which to tip in the chat and in the Q&A and on Facebook. So if you are so inclined and you enjoy the tour and you have a little bit extra, um, send it over and I'll make sure that Elena receives it. So Elena, if you're ready, we can go to the top of the Q&A and we can address the questions as you see fit and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Ready, ready to go. All right, so Scott Coburn, why is it referred to as a state? I was under the impression that Vatican City is a country unto itself. It is, so state in this case is used as a synonym of country with a cap C. Janet, can the coins in the Vatican be used elsewhere? Yes, Janet, absolutely. You can use them wherever in Europe. Eli Clark, what percentage of the occupants are permanent residents? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so there are less than a thousand people um, living in Vatican City State. Uh, it's a very peculiar thing where some of the citizens of Vatican City are not living in Vatican City, of course. Some of those passports that I showed you are issued to diplomats, for instance, uh, the apostolic diplomats, so living all around the world. Uh, and not everybody working in Vatican City State or living in Vatican City State has a Vatican passport. So it is always very dif difficult to, uh, to give you an exact number because it depends on what you're asking. Are they the citizens or the actual occupants? Because of course, there are some lay people living in the Vatican, for instance, the Swiss guards that can marry and have kids. And those are the only kids uh, ever living inside the, the borders of Vatican City State. You've got the gardeners with their families. You've got the policemen, uh, Italian, but working for the Pope. So there are some lay people. They make up for less than a thousand living within the borders. Maria, I hope I answered the question. Maria Dunn, why was there a decision to create a separate Vatican state? Mara, can you leave that there for a second? Because the story is a little bit intricated. I'm going to try and make it easy. Imagine the Italian peninsula. We are in the middle of the 1800s. The Italian peninsula is a patchwork of different states, principates, monarchies, the Pope's state occupying kind of the whole middle chunk of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. At this point, uh, one of these little kingdoms uh, decides uh, or thinks, uh, hmm, wouldn't it be great uh, to, you know, have it all? And he starts with his army to conquer every other Italian territory. And when I say Italian, I mean Italian, Italian was already the language, but again, politically speaking, there were borders within the peninsula. This king conquers it all, including the city of Rome. So he conquers the state that was the Pope's. And the Pope takes refuge within those defensive walls that are now the borders of his own state. But the state doesn't exist yet. We are in the 1860s. This is when Italy was born. And no one cares about the Pope for 60 years. And then comes the time when Mussolini is our prime minister in the 1920s. And at some point, someone says, it is about time we make things right and we decide, what is the Pope doing? Is he a sovereign on that territory? Is he not? Is he just uh, the, the, chief, the chief of the faith or is he also a political figure? And that's why 
they had to decide and sign a treaty to create uh, the state of the Pope uh, to give him back a little bit of the authority that he had had uh, for so many centuries. I'm done, Mara, thank you. Uh, was Vatican City damaged during World War II? There were only three bombs uh, dropped uh, on Vatican City State uh, and uh, not much damage was done, thankfully. Um, they think that the, the aim was either the antenna of Vatican Radio because they were using the radio to uh, send out messages uh, to find people who had been lost, or the station. There is a train station within Vatican City, uh, maybe, but they, they didn't uh, succeed. And so those were the, there, there is still a, 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 a place in the walls, uh, even if you're standing on, on the Rome side, where you can see the damage to the wall of the bombs. Uh, Joni Sompirak, that's definitely a mistake. Uh, with the increase in terrorism, have there been increased concerns for security in Vatican City? So um, if we're talking about the years, uh, if you remember after the Bataclan, so the terrorist attacks in Paris, uh, and then the Belgium ones, uh, so the, the Madrid ones, several attacks uh, uh, one year after the next, then yes, uh, not just in Vatican City, but everywhere in Europe, you saw the army everywhere with their, you know, the machine guns uh, uh, at the ready. Nowadays, uh, it looks like, uh, not just for Vatican City, but to me at least, it looks like, uh, um, you know, we're in a, a bit of a quieter uh, moment, um, terrorism-wise, uh, but security is definitely Definitely um, very tight in the Vatican. Eh? The Pope always uh, goes around with his uh, with his bodyguards. Uh, uh, his car is, you know, a, a, an armored one. Uh, but mostly, more than uh, uh, with the increase uh, in terrorism of those of these years, uh, it was after, if you remember, if you were already an adult, uh, the uh, attack on John Paul II's life. Uh, if it was ninety four, if I don't, if I'm not wrong, and after in, in Saint Peter's Square. Where he was shot. And so after that, uh, security in the Vatican was uh, rethought completely and, and tightened for sure. Uh, then we have an anonymous spectator. What is the entrance fee for the Vatican Museum, please? Uh, so the ticket, um, so I, uh, I did send out uh, uh, an email to Mara that she will send out to all of you, um, where I also included some tips for when you visit. Uh, and one of these is uh, book ahead your ticket, as I said before, but especially book it through the official Vatican Museum's website. I included the link, so it's easy, super easy to do it, because there are many touristic agencies that call the skip the line or that try to sell you skip the line tours, but you pay commissions of course on those if you book directly with the vatican no commission you only have to pay the money for the ticket and the i think two or four i don't remember euros for you know processing your request so admin expenses so the total is 16 or 17 euros which is more or less 16 or 17 dollars in us dollars so it's not you know for what you get it's really cheap uh, meryl p how many stories is the St. Peter's Basilica. Just the one, even though, of course, there are passages uh, to go up uh, uh, for maintenance, uh, mainly. Um, and then there is the, the ascending of the dome. So the dome also at its base has one uh, story. And then you climb uh, in the inner stairs to get to the top, where there is also another. So I would say the floor, the roof, and the dome. Carrie Gibbs, can you still visit the Vatican and go under the catacombs? Yes, even though there are no cat, it's not called catacombs because uh, it was never a catacomb. Uh, so you have uh, to make it easy because it's not easy to understand. Uh, you've got the level of the of the pavement nowadays where the Basilica of St. Peter is. Uh, and then you go one level down and this you can do whenever you visit the, the Church of St. Peter, the Basilica of St. Peter under that canopy that I showed you are stairs that take you down to the level called the grottos. The grottos is an underground level where the popes get buried. So it is where you can visit the tombs of several popes. 
And then there is a separate visit that needs to be booked way ahead of time. And I did include instructions and advices in the email and links and everything. So you will see how to do it. If you want to go one level further down, and that is called the necropolis, city of the dead, which is that cemetery of ancient Roman times uh, where the tomb of St. Peter was discovered to be. So you also get to visit, but that's only with a guided visit that you have booked small groups, uh, it's underground. Uh, so you have to book that part, but yes, you can go. Faria or Faraya Kandaker. When did the Vatican become a significant place for Christianity? In the year, I would say in the year 64 AD. Um, Vatican, the name, I didn't tell you this, uh, the name is the name of the hill. Mm? Rome is a very hilly uh, part of the land, and one of the hills was already named Vatican before the Romans. Um, on that hill, which was way outside of the city center at the time of the Romans, uh, there were two things. A stadium, what the Romans called a circus. Uh, this is an oval uh, place where you can do chariot uh, rides, uh, chariot uh, races, the one that we saw in the rendering, and the cemetery, which was, uh, you know, far away from the eyes of the authorities, and so the first Christians uh, buried their dead there, not to be seen. So I would say in the year 64, when uh, the apostle Peter is uh, killed because he's Christian, on the top of Vatican Hill, starting, you know, the, this uh, thousands and millions of pilgrims uh, going to visit his tomb, that's when Vatican Hill becomes a central point uh, for Christians. D. Sant'Angelo looks lovely. What's the latest on Americans being able to go in person to Italy? What a question. What a, the, a million dollar question. We don't know. Uh, I know you guys are kind of going quickly with your vaccinations. So we are going. Uh, we couldn't go slower. Uh, we have a lack of doses, uh, simply put. So I don't know, though, if the decision will be that you will get to, you know, enter our country when we are also all vaccinated, or if it will suffice that you guys are vaccinated to visit, I think the latter. So possibly this summer, why not? Uh, v. Deans, I think. Or Deans. What is the sculpture of Leo Kwan depicting? Do you have six or seven hours? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I try, I'm try, I'll try to be, to be quick. Now, you guys, uh, I'm sure, have heard about the Iliad and the Odyssey, the two poems that uh, the ancient Greek Homer wrote about a war. The war was between the Greeks, uh, who went and put under siege the city of Troy. And in after 10 years of siege, they still weren't done because the city was not uh, uh, was not crumbling under the, the, the strength and the might of the Greek army. But in the midst of the Greeks, uh, was the cleverest man on earth named Ulysses. Ulysses thought of a little trick. Let's build a huge hollow wooden horse and let's conceal part of our army in the belly of this statue. Let's leave it on the beach in front of the gates of the city and let's leave. And let's see, if the Trojans bring the horse within their walls, well then by nightfall, our army concealed inside the horse can get out and open the gates for the rest of us waiting outside. So this was the trick of the horse. Leoquan is, this is a story that is not told by Homer, but by Virgil. Leoquan is a priest. He's a Trojan, a citizen of the city of Troy. He's a priest. He is uh, blind, but he can see the future mm, in a very typical irony of Greek mythology. So because he's able to foresee the future, he knows what the horse is. And when uh, uh, the Trojans are on the beach in front of the gates of their city debating, should we bring it in? What is this? What is this huge horse that suddenly appeared on our beach? Should we bring it in? Should we not bring it in? Should we trust it? Should we not trust it? Leokon knows that it's a trick by the Greeks and tries to warn his co-citizens. Uh, 
Uh, but the gods, uh, the Greek gods, had other plans. Uh, the gods in Greek mythology interfere a lot uh, in uh, human matters and they take action. Athena and Poseidon wanted the Greeks to prevail. They wanted the horse to the trick of the horse to uh, to to go through. So they want to silence Leocon and they send two huge uh, monstrous creatures from the sea to crush in their spires uh, Leocon and his poor two poor twin sons that were with him. So uh, the Trojans dumb as they were, because let's say it, they were dumb. They see this scene, they recognize it as a sign of the gods, but they interpret it wrongly. They say, if the gods are silencing Leokuan, well, then it means he's speaking falsehood. Let's not listen to what he was saying. Let's bring this beautiful horse within our walls. And we all know that that was the doom of the city of Troy. This is the story of Leokuan. Emily Wood, how many of the statues are made of marble? Lots of them. I wouldn't, I couldn't give you a, a, an exact statistic, but lots of them are made out of marble and lots of them are made out of granite, which is not exactly marble. Uh, the thing is that usually in ancient Greece, uh, statues were cast in bronze. Mm -hmm. We are left with very, very, very few rare bronze uh, things, uh, artifacts uh, uh, coming from ancient Greek times, uh, but we are lucky to have, we don't have the original bronze uh, Greek statue, but we have the marble exact copy that the ancient Romans did of the Greek statue made of bronze. So that's why the majority of ancient statues are made out of stone, either granite or marble, and not bronze. When you see in a museum on display in, a, in, a, in an exhibition a, an antique piece of bronze, consider yourself lucky. We, we don't have any more pieces of bronze because they were melted down during the ages to uh, produce new artifacts or usually um, weapons. Doreen Brayboy, what is the image of this piece with the snake sumblick off? Hmm. What is the image of this piece with the snake sumblick off? With the snake symbolic? <laughs> oh, the, the, but I, if you're referring back to the statue of Leoquan, there is no symbol linked to the snake in ancient Greek mythology other than being, you know, a stealthy creature that slides uh, and, and can crush you to death in, in its spires. Uh, so from ancient art, uh, it, it's Christianity that attributes uh, uh, a symbol to the snake uh, after the scriptures. Arl of Potash. Leokoan statue is the head on the main center person on backwards. All I see is hair, even though he is obviously facing forward. No, it's not on backwards. Um, it is as it as it was originally. His hair are depicted and sculpted in a way that suggests movement because the statue comes from a time when uh, ancient Greeks wanted to not only represent well the human body but also uh, give it uh, um, make it dynamic and and dramatic and theatrical and then show you you know the emotions so this was a very dramatic scene and maybe the hair flying in all directions is is something that they used uh, also to convey this Another anonymous, uh, are there any seminaries in the Vatican City? Uh, if you mean conferences, sometimes they do. Um, I've never participated in one. Um, I so believe they mean seminaries in the sense that um, it's religious education for priests. Ah, within the borders of Vatican City? Not that I know of, but of course, uh, the, church, uh, the church with a capital C, owns every church, uh, every Catholic church in the world, uh, every convent, every monastery. So there's plenty places uh, in Rome, even close to the, the borders of Vatican City State where you've got seminaries. Thank you, Mara. Uh, Penn Hackney, how old is the Leo Kwan? Leo Kwan comes from the first century AD, not before Christ, AD. The original bronze came from uh, two, two centuries and a half before Christ. Uh, Michel Weintraub, 
where was this piece found? Why is it in this condition? And I'm guessing, Michelle, you're talking about the torso of the Belvedere. It was found underground uh, as every other ancient piece of art in Rome. Uh, it was possibly, probably originally placed uh, uh, in a sorry, in a private home uh, to decorate the garden uh, of a wealthy family, or uh, as Leocon, the other one that I showed you, the one in good conditions, uh, it was probably decorating the public thermal baths uh, built by one of the Roman emperors. So these uh, uh, statues are always find underground when archaeologists dig. Sometimes a private individual finds uh, something ancient uh, in his own garage because maybe he's enlarging his garage and he finds a Roman column. It happens. Uh, why it is in this condition? Well, because it's been there for 2000 years uh, and probably, probably we find it uh, after originally it smashed on the floor. So it went into pieces and then with time it got covered up by debris, by, by the, the soil level rising. Rome is a city with a river passing through. The river brings a lot of debris, you know, in its course and deposits it on the side. So the level of the street in Rome rose uh, several feet uh, since Roman times uh, during the centuries. And that's why we find these things in these conditions, the columns in pieces, the statues broken up. Terry Lynn Kogi. How long would this walking tour take? Distance, uh, how many miles? Um, so, um, miles, uh, it is 15, uh, I think 15 miles. Am I saying something stupid? Uh, or nine miles, 15 kilometers, sorry. So it is a long walk. And I didn't show you everything that you would see when walking through the museum. So the obliged path that you take from the entrance to get to the Sistine Chapel, which is the end point of the museum where the exit is, it's a one-way path. So I didn't show you everything. It's a long walk, you need comfy shoes. The tour, the, the, the basic classic tour that I give, that everybody gives, not just me, every guide lasts three hours, uh, mm, very difficultly less than that. And it, it includes uh, the Basilica of St. Peter. So you do the museums, the Sistine Chapel and the Basilica of St. Peter, and then you end up in the square in front of the Basilica. So three hours, not, uh, not including the aperitif. Eh? The aperitif is something else. Kimberly Stern, painting on the wall or fresco in Pope's room, all frescoes. Thank you, Kimberly. This is a very important thing. Both in the Sistine Chapel and in the papal apartment of Julius II painted by Raphael, we were looking at frescoes, not paintings on the wall. The difference is easily explained. I usually use the, the example of a t-shirt. If you want something printed on your t-shirt, an image on your t-shirt, you either print it on the t-shirt and it's going to peel off after several times you wash it. But if it's the threads, the cotton threads that are dyed and then sewn together to make the image, well, then that image is gonna stay on your t-shirt forever. This is what fresco is. Fresco in Italian means fresh because you'd have to paint on the wall while the plaster is still fresh. So you have to be very quick. If the, the plaster dries up before you're done, you have to replaster the wall. And if you do it correctly, then while drying up, the wall will drink in the colors. So once the wall is dry, the colors are not uh, applied on the wall. They are part of the wall. And that's why the Sistine Chapel and Raphael's frescoes in Julius II rooms uh, look like they are brand new after 500 years. They will never, ever fade. Lynette O'Brien, are the mosaics on the floor of the Constantine room contemporary to the paintings on the walls or are they from the Roman Empire? All the, I want to say all the mosaic floors, maybe I'm wrong, but all the mosaics floor in the Vatican museums and in the Basilica of St. Peter and in the Sistine Chapel come from ancient Roman times. They actually come from ancient Roman 
architectures. So the mosaics uh, come from uh, ancient Roman villas or the thermal baths complexes of the ancient Romans. The floor in the Basilica of St. Peter comes from uh, which is not in tiny in design as the mosaic that you're referring to. It's made out of bigger marble pieces. Those marble pieces, for instance, when you see a circle, a marble circle, that was a column once that gets sliced uh, into slices then, that you can then use to inlaying them in the floor to make a pattern. If you wanna be polite, this was done a lot, eh? like the melting down of the bronze statues to cast cannons. Uh, this was done a lot by the popes uh, and a lot by in general, uh, rich, powerful people in Rome. Um, if you wanna be polite, you call it recycling. Um, I call it stealing and looting. Uh, so they just had all these ruins of the great Roman empire lying there in the city of Rome. They were not no use for anyone anymore. The temple, who cared about the temple? We have a new God now, we don't worship those gods anymore so we don't use these venues anymore and they were also in this repair so let's just take this beautiful column let's just take this beautiful statue let's just, let's just take this bronze that it's otherwise very costly and just use it as if it were there for the taking so this is what happened a lot Rhonda Sullivan is there a three-day pass or any multi-day available to the Vatican museums it is so much to absorb in only one day Rhonda, you're totally right, and it would be a genius idea, but no, you have to buy three different tickets or one ticket for each day that you want to enter the Vatican Museums. Jessica Locke, what time period was the star ceilings within the chapels? In general, <clears throat> in Italy, it was uh, during the Middle Ages already and until the early Renaissance times. Mm -hmm. The Sistine Chapel one was done uh, in 1480, 1481, uh, more or less, at the end of the 1400s, so already in Renaissance times, uh, uh, art-wise, uh, art history-wise. Uh, but the ceilings, like the one I showed you in San Gimignano, in the other church, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that was done way before, so in the Middle Ages. Leah Jenkins, so why does he paint alone? <laughs> why because he considers himself to be the only one capable of doing something like that. And also because he's very, um, he doesn't uh, agree with what other people do. And he, he, he's a control freak. He, she's talking about Michelangelo, of course. He's a control freak. Uh, and uh, he was extremely um, fixed uh, on details. Everything had to be perfect. So he was probably, you know, definitely type A. Possibly, I don't know, he had an a, a obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's why he painted alone. And nobody could stand him, eh? so it was mutual. Christy Pointer, why is there a partition in the middle of the Sistine Chapel? The rood screen, which is uh, carved in marble and it's a fixed screen, you cannot move it, was placed in the Sistine Chapel at the time, at a time when the museums were not there yet. The chapel was just a chapel and it was marking the spot where you and I could go no further. So uh, the inner sanctum of the church towards the altar was the part where clergy, only clergy were allowed to visit. And on this side of the root screen, uh, the, the, the people assisting uh, in mass, the watching mass happening. So you and I, lay people, uh, that's, that was the, 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 the point after which they could go no further. Doreen Brayboy, interesting that there are only but a few images of another race in these paintings representing God's creation. Why is that? That's a very good question, Doreen. It's a, it's a very good observation. Um, well, look, it is true that the last judgment by Michelangelo was painted in the 1530s. Uh, so um, 50, 40 years after uh, a new continent has been discovered uh, and the fact that the earth is round uh, and so between Europe and, and Asia is uh, the Americas uh, and all the voyages uh, uh, through also the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Reformation. So the world changed a lot in those 50, 40, 50 years. Um, but society in Europe at least uh, 
was not cosmopolitan and was not um, um, multiracial as we are used uh, to nowadays. Uh, so th that's why um, so many few images of other races uh, in the paintings that Michelangelo had probably never seen uh, a person coming from Far Eastern Asia, or maybe he had because he visited Venice, which was a city of lots of commerces, but you know, it was, it was a rare thing still in the 1530s. Mm -hmm. Lori Kaufman, uh, where in the Vatican City does the Pope live and how does he travel around uh, the Vatican City State? So Pope friends, so if you remember that I showed you that window from the Apostolic Palace where he shows himself on the square, that is his study. And usually that is a room uh, that is part of the apartment of the popes uh, nowadays. But Pope Francis uh, chose a humbler residence. Uh, so he chose, if you look at the Basilica of St. Peter's, you have the Basilica in front of you, the residence of the Pope, which is called Residence uh, St. Martha, is to the back of the church and left, on the left side uh, towards the sacristy of the church. So that's where uh, Pope Francis lives. He travels around Vatican City on foot. Vatican City is very small, it's less than one square mile. So he does have what we call the Papa Mobile, the white car with the glass uh, box uh, where you can also see him in procession, but he very, very seldomly uses it. He wants contact uh, with the people. He wants to shake hands. He wants to hug the kids. Uh, he wants to kiss uh, uh, the people uh, coming to, to, to touch him and to see him, he want to bless uh, the people in the square. So he very seldomly uses the automobile. Uh, Jay Levi, how much time is involved in deciding who will be the next Pope? Ah, it decides a lot. It, sorry, it, it depends a lot. Um, we have uh, conclaves. I think the Pope Francis one was very, very short. Uh, uh, it lasted a night. But we had the shortest in history was like three hours and the longest in history was three years. Uh, that's when conclave was born, the concept of locking the cardinal in to make them, you know, uh, move a little bit quicker in their decision. So they vary, they vary a lot. Nowadays, they tend not to be too long um, because of, you know, how structured the state is and how structured the hierarchy of the clergy is. So more or less, uh, you know, there are very few names up for election and you already know who the next Pope is going to be. Not you and I, but the Cardinals, definitely. Diana Lennon, two questions uh, from Diana. Are there 11 statues on the dome, bottom of our screen? And the second if is, if not, how many and who are they? The statues on top of, uh, not the dome, but the facade, uh, the, the front of the Church of St. Peter are 10. Sorry, you're right, they are 11. And they show us the apostles, all but one, mm, including Peter, to whom the church is dedicated. But then, where's that missing apostle? There are 12 in total in the square. So advancing from the front of the church into the square, you've got two larger statues uh, on the square pavement, and so closer also to us in height, of Peter again, because he, of course he's the star of this place, and Paul, the two main apostles, not just because they are the two main apostles, but also because they are the patron saints of the city of Rome. So in Rome, they are celebrated on the same day in June, and they, they have a prominence for the Romans, and that's why 11 statues, because it's 11 apostles plus Peter repeated and Paul in the square. Theodora Cosma Volintiru, mistake. Why is the wall red? Does it symbolize something? Red symbolizes the passion of the Christ, the fact that he spilled his blood and died on the cross for us, which is also what the red wine during a Catholic mass service represents. Um, why the wall red, the, the red wall? Uh, because, uh, uh, no, maybe your question was just why the color red and not why they put the, the, the colored wall there. Anyways, the wall was marked with a color because being at a time when Christianity was still illegal, 
tombs had to be kind of secretive and they couldn't just write a marble plate with the name Peter on it. Plus uh, Christians were poor people. They didn't have much money, not the elite, not yet. So the elite was Christians. So Peter died. He was buried in a poor person tomb in the ground, very simply. And to you know mark the spot just so that people could easily find where to pay their homage, the red, the wall was marked with a with a plaster colored in red. I wanna samota. Hopefully that was right. Uh, where can I find the animation of the very first times of Vatican? It was great to understand the envelopment, uh, the development of the place. Uh, thank you, Juana. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, there's lots of renderings uh, made available, or even maybe if you just Google it, uh, you will find on other websites, uh, the animations. Uh, Audrey West, uh, what was the name of the man who recently passed away? that was responsible for much of the restoration of the Sistine Chapel. And what was the name of his book? I didn't get it written down quickly enough. Audrey, sure. Um, if you can't write it quickly enough, you can see the recording of this event uh, from tomorrow onwards, I guess. But the name of the maestro was Colalucci. I will spell it for you. C-O-L-A-L-U-C-C-I. And the book that he wrote, uh, if I remember correctly, because of course he was Italian, yeah? He wrote the book in Italian, but I think the translation in English, in English is Michelangelo and I. But if you look Colalucci, the name of the restorer of the Sistine Chapel online, you will also find uh, uh, his publications and the titles of his publication. Patrick Costello, who was the battle of the cross fought between Constantine versus when he has his vision. The battle was the battle of uh, the Milvian Bridge, a bridge in Rome still nowadays, and it was fought between Constantine and Maxentius. At that time, in the year 311, 10, when the battle was fought, the Roman Empire had been divided into two parts, Eastern and Western, with two emperors uh, governing at the same time. Constantine was the Western part emperor, and Maxentius was uh, uh, the Eastern one. By the way, Maxentius was also the son in law, um, Constantine's son, in, uh, sorry, Constantine's brother in law. Constantine has, had married uh, Maxentius' sister, but this didn't stop Constantine from killing Maxentius to seize uh, the totality of the Roman Empire. Constantine is also the one who moves the capital to Constantinople, uh, Istanbul nowadays. It is after Constantine. He himself names the city Constantinople um, because he had liked it. And so he moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. Rose Brennan, a quick question from a British art history student. Has Elena studied art history? She's so nuanced in her analysis and I've been writing notes for class. Amazing tour. Thank you, Rose. I'm very glad you liked it. I did, I, I did, I, I have a, a degree in art history from university. That's, that's what I studied, yes. <laughs> glad, Gail Ogle, is the Vatican smaller than Monaco? Yes, Monaco is the second smallest, if I'm not wrong, after the Vatican. Uh, another anonymous spectator. Can Ellen, can Elena help advise travelers to be in the planning of their trip to Italy? Yes. Well, we don't have your name, unfortunately, but um, uh, definitely you can contact me. I'm sure Mara can share with you my email address. I, I'll be happy to. Um, I, I honestly, I can't wait to go back to work. I, I haven't been working for two years, for a year and a half now, but um, I, I would be glad to if I can. Karen O'Brown, beautiful, thank you for all. What's the name of the liquor in the spritz? So the name of the liquor in the spritz is Aperol and it is spelled A-P-E-R-O-L, Aperol. Marie, Marie uh, Labanks, what is the significance of the Egyptian obelisk in the Vatican? So Rome is filled with obelisks, um, come either coming from Egypt, so original ancient ones, or uh, obelisks that the ancient Romans, uh, loving Egyptian art so much, made uh, as copies of the style that they found in Egypt. Uh, 
Egyptian art flooded the Roman Empire when Egypt was conquered and became part of Cleopatra. And so at the time of Caesar, uh, when Egypt became part of the Roman Empire under Augustus, more or less. The symbol of the obelisk in the Christian faith, so the obelisk was a symbol in the Egyptian religion. It was a needle literally pointing to the skies, symbolizing the god of the sun, the sun god Ra in the Egyptian pantheon of divinities. The Christians found obelisks in Rome because again, the Romans had liked them just because how they looked and they just took them and placed them in the squares in Rome. But the, when the Christians, uh, seized power, took power, and the Roman Empire ceased to exist, uh, gave the obelisks uh, uh, another and even one more layer of significance. Uh, instead of the sun god Ra of the Egyptian pantheon, the obelisk was now pointing towards the skies uh, where Jesus Christ lives. Uh, in fact, many obelisks are topped uh, with a cross. That's a cross that the Christians uh, added on top of the obelisks to make it, because you know what, when Christianity was finally able to unfold itself completely and be out in the open, they had to decide, are we going to create our own new symbols that are new for the world, no one has ever seen them before, or are we taking you deciding to use the symbols that have been here for millennia that people already know what they mean because they are familiar with these symbols just adding a layer of our own and they chose the latter and it was very clever marty o'reilly is the pieta the same one that was attacked several years ago yes and the sculpture the statue that we saw within saint peter's basilica by michelangelo was vandalized in 72 in 1972 by a madman uh, a geologian, an Australian geologian who entered, because at the time the glass was not there. It was, there was nothing protecting the Pieta. You and I, we could get to the Pieta and touch it if, if we wanted to. Uh, so this guy enters the church, gets to the statue. He has a hammer in his hand, no one had noticed. And he hacks at the statue 14, 15 times, if I'm not wrong, and he damages it uh, heavily. He even severs Mary's nose clean, boom, off her face. It was restored with a very conservative, uh, uh, attentive restoration. So they didn't retouch it. They didn't add anything. And they used glues that can be you know, undone and taken off so that they respected the statue anymore. But they decided that the Pieta is so perfect uh, that you have to you know, rehab it whole. And hence also the, the very thick bulletproof glass that now defends it. Is it true that Michelangelo wore the same shoes and didn't take them off for the entirety of the time he was working on the Sistine Chapel? I've heard this. I've heard this. It, it seems that this was the case, but who knows? David Villalpando, is it possible to visit other areas of the Vatican, such as the gardens, without taking holy orders? <laughs> David, absolutely. Yes, you can visit many areas. The Vatican museums are called in the plural. It is not a mistake because they are several museums put together under the same roof, but they comprise of an Egyptian museum, an Etruscan museum. They have a museum of carriages that have on display all the carriages that the different popes in different eras used before uh, automobiles were invented. And the gardens also are a place that you can visit booking a tour because the gardens are not visitable on your own. Whereas you can enter the museums on your own without a guide, just booking your ticket and going, or you can do it with a guide. The gardens you can do only with a guide. And there are some spots in the gardens, the private ones that we cannot see because they are just for the Pope to enjoy. But a lot of the gardens, a big chunk, you can definitely visit. And again, we didn't see all of it with me. Uh, there's a lot of places that I, I, I couldn't show you in the museums that are part of the normal uh, path uh, that you pay for with a normal ticket. 
Claudia Vargas, uh, what is the best time to visit? What are the best places to stay nearby for elderly travel? Claudia, the best time to visit. If I were you, I would avoid the summer, uh, especially because it's super hot and also because of all the visitors. Now with COVID, things might change, guys, especially regarding you know the number of people um, that are traveling uh, at the same time. But usually Rome, uh, COVID apart, uh, is uh, uh, incredibly crowded as a city all year round. The best months being uh, February, February, the beginning of March, and definitely October and November, because those are the ones uh, where usually people work, uh, and so not many of us have holidays during that time, and it's also not super uh, hot as it is in the summer, so that's definitely the best place to, to visit. I have only one question. What does the yellow color on the papal city flag represent? Thanks. Um, Yellow is uh, the golden color uh, for Antonomasia, and it is also the symbol of Peter. Um, so it symbolizes one of the keys that Peter uh, gets um, gifted uh, uh, by Jesus. So that's what the flag represents. It, they were also, um, once upon a time, the flag was uh, yellow and purple or reddish purple, which were the colors of the city of Rome, the temporal, the, the lay colors of Rome. Uh, so, and then at some point the Vatican took on the white, uh, um, but it comes from there. Christian Kia. The trees in Rome, tall with leaves only on the top, are stunning. What are they called? If you mean the umbrella trees that you see everywhere in Rome, they are maritime pines. They are very typical of the Mediterranean coasts. They usually grow and thrive uh, uh, close to uh, the Mediterranean coasts, so close to the shores, close to the, the seawater. And they have, they are not trimmed, they are not manicured, they are naturally taking on this shape of a very long uh, trunk with this umbrella shaped greenery on top. And so maritime pines. Rosa Ferrand, Michelangelo has other abilities a part of painting and writing? Well, as if that was not enough. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, he painted very well. He drew very well. He did frescoes very well, which as I explained is a very difficult technique all of its own. He sculpted, uh, he's mainly a sculptor, incredible, incredible sculptor. The Pieta that I showed you, he did when he was 23, but we have works by Michelangelo when he was 15 and 13 and he had that skill already. He wrote poetry, he was an architect, uh, he was a military architect. So he was a very skilled, uh, uh, all-rounded uh, genius, a little bit like Leonardo, and that he dabbled in different sciences. Can you repeat the days that the Pope can be seen? This is Susan York, sorry, and this was number one. Can you repeat the days uh, that the Pope can be seen? Yes, Wednesday mornings and Sunday mornings is when you can get uh, to St. Peter's, assist, you can watch mass, and you see also the Pope showing himself to bless the square. Number two, also, what time of day would you recommend visiting the Vatican and how many hours to designate to get a really good tour completed? And three, do you recommend a guided tour? So yes, I do recommend a guided tour, not because I'm a guide, but because you've seen the wealth, the sheer wealth of different types of art. You have the ceilings and the floors and everything in between is a piece of art from different time periods of different styles, different... So to, if you enjoy art uh, and you enjoy understanding a bit what you're seeing, uh, if you like just to contemplate it, that's fine. But if you want to understand a little bit the stories that are behind the, the different pieces, why they're there, who was the artist, what's the meaning of what you're looking, then definitely a guide who points your attention, you know, in this wealth of different things. Uh, that's what you should be looking at because you don't have the time to look at everything. And so the guide knows which ones are the most important highlights uh, that you can't miss. And uh, as, of, uh, as for the time of day, 
I would recommend, but I wrote this down in the email that I sent to Mara. So you have written, written it down. Uh, I suggest between the months of May and October, every Friday, so in the summer months, every Friday, uh, they extend their opening hours. Uh, so they, they, they keep the museums open until 11 p.m. That's when you want to go. You want to go at 6 p.m., on a, on a Friday night between the months of May and October, if you visit during those months uh, and enjoy the museums in the quiet, uh, you see them uh, uh, with the light of the day at six, uh, but then uh, with darkness uh, falling uh, uh, and everything being lit up, uh, you, you can't visit the Basilica of St. Peter on Friday nights because the church is not part of the museums. And so it's uh, of course already closed, but you can, you can separate, you you know the two things one day you do the museums one day you do the basilica of saint peter michael amowitz i just remembered the atm in vatican city at the time 2010 the only one in the world with a latin option <laughs> michael I, I think that's still 2020 2021 the only one with a latin option the atm machine in the vatican yeah Carrie Haley, very well done. Awesome presentation. Thank you. My pleasure, Carrie. Thank you. All right. So I think that comes to a question for me, which is I didn't catch the beginning. How can I see the recordings? And I'll, I'll tell you that now we have three places that all of the recordings of all of our tours are one on our website, girltraveltours.com, two on Facebook, the Facebook page, girltraveltours.com, and three on our YouTube channel girltraveltours.com. So if you do a search on any of those places, you will be able to see all the recordings of all the tours we ever did. And that leads me to thank Elena profusely because we sat and did questions for an hour. And I know your time is valuable, but I certainly appreciate your insights. Um, and thank everybody else for coming out. Uh, I know that you enjoy these and we certainly appreciate you coming back. That's the reason we come back week after week. So as long as you want to come back come back out and um, view new places through these virtual tour presentations, we would be happy to deliver them. So thank you, Elena, with all my heart. It's so nice to see you again and I'll let you close as well. I just wanted to say that I just wanted to send out a big thank you to everyone who's writing messages because as soon as the event ends, I cannot read them anymore. So I, I'm not able to read all of your comments and questions and thanks, but I see them coming in. and so. It is my very pleasure to run these events. So thank you for your for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Elena. We'll see you next week, everybody. Take care.